Hello there, everyone. Welcome to the channel or welcome back if you've been here before. Now, for those who have seen previous episodes in this series of examining the early SDA use of the word person and its variants, you already know what we're doing and why. But for those who haven't, I'm going to briefly explain and I'm going to start with the why part. Now, the reason we're doing this is because Ellen White identified one of the pillars of our faith as being the personality of God. Now, there are other important pillars. A pillar doctrine is something that's very important. But she identified the personality of God as a pillar that is everything to us as a people. And she also said that false theories or false ideas of this doctrine, the personality of God, if followed to their logical conclusion, sweep away the whole Christian economy. So it's broader than just whether it's important for SDAs. It's important for Christianity at large. But the reason why we're also including other pioneers beyond just what Ellen White had to say is because further on in the same manuscript, Ellen White herself says that when men come in who would move one pin or pillar from the foundation which God has established by his Holy Spirit, let the aged men who were pioneers in our work speak plainly. And of course, in 1905, some of the aged men who were pioneers in the Seventh-day Adventist work were still alive, so they could, they were still there to speak plainly. And she also says, and let those who are dead speak also by reprinting of their articles in our periodicals. Now, clearly she thought that if people uh, needed to understand the truth of this pillar doctrine, the personality of God, that reading the articles written by the aged pioneers, uh, the aged men who were pioneers in our work, aged as compared to the year 1905, of course, right, when she made this statement, reading those articles would help you understand the pillar doctrine of the personality of God. So it's more than just what did Ellen White have to say about it. Part of what she said about it was that we should be looking at what the pioneers had to say about it beyond her, right? Okay, so that's what we're doing. And we are in particular examining certain statements that the early pioneers made, including Ellen White, where they are particularly talking about what it means for God to be a person. And they use different expressions. And um, in so doing, they use different variations of the word person. So sometimes they say things like he is a personal being or he is a personage. Um, in this episode with R. F. Cottrell, we're going to be looking at a particular phrase you see on the bottom. The son had the personal appearance of the father. Okay. So if we want to understand what they meant by these things in connection with the doctrine of the personality of God, then we really have no chance of doing that unless we know what they meant by the word person and its variants in the first place. And if you happen to see, um, I think it was the second episode in the series going through David Arnold's use of the word person and its variants. I give a really good illustration of why it's so important to to have the same understanding of a word and uh, in order to rightly understand what is even being spoken about. So I won't repeat that, but it's there if you want to check it out. Okay, so we're going to look at what this pioneer had to say, Roswell F. Cottrell or R.F. Cottrell, a lot of times, or even just R.F.C., uh, a lot of times it was just his initials that you would see at the end of an article. But he um, was a very early pioneer. He came into the Seventh-day Adventist movement in 1853. Um, I'm pretty sure it was through the efforts of, of um, J.N. Loughborough, if I'm remembering correctly. And in 1858, Ellen White asked him to write the, um, well, she asked him to write the introduction to her first volume of spiritual gifts, which was published in 1858. She might have asked him earlier than that. I don't know how much earlier she asked him that. But anyway, um, I really recommend reading that introduction because um, it's very clarifying for the topic of what is the spirit of prophecy, which we also have some videos on this channel uh, going through that topic. So you can check that out if, um, if you would like. So now Roswell Cottrell died in 1892. So when Ellen White made the statement in 1905 that the aged 
uh, men who had already died, um, those who had died, they should we should allow them to speak by reprinting their articles in our periodicals. So he would be one of those people that she was referring to. So without further ado, we'll start by reading from one of his articles that deals directly with the personality of God. And then I'll share a bit from Ellen White um, that relates to what he wrote and we'll see the harmony between their teachings on this subject. Okay, so this, we're actually going to read the whole article. It's not very long, and we will do some commenting along the way. He starts off by saying, We take two plain and positive statements of the Word of God, place them side by side, and draw a simple, legitimate conclusion. So number one, God formed man of the dust of the ground. Okay, that's taken from Genesis. Number two, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Okay, also from Genesis. So two plain and positive statements of the word of God placed side by side, draw a simple legitimate conclusion, which is that which was formed of dust was made in the image of God. Okay, then he goes on, but it is objected that God is without body or parts, and therefore this conclusion must be erroneous, that man was morally in the image of God, that his likeness to God must be a moral likeness. And just as a quick side note, if you see italics on the screen, that is original to the article. Um, any emphasis that I did was just in color and bolding to just make it pop and, and easier to track with what I'm saying. So but the italics, those were in the original. So he says, um, it's objected. God is without body or parts. So your conclusion must be wrong. Man was morally in the image of God. The likeness to God must be a moral likeness. That man was like God in moral character or in his attributes or both. Those ministers that say, as many do, that man lost the image of his creator in his fall must refer to man's moral character, for they do not wish to be understood that he lost the immortality of the soul. Okay, so real quick there, you know, the objection is, hey, man is either in the likeness of God in moral character or in attributes or both. Immortality of the soul is the attributes part, okay? All right, so we'll just go on. He says, in regard, in response to that, he says, now man could have no real positive moral character till he had formed it by his own action in reference to moral law. When first created, his character was not formed. He was innocent and was pronounced very good, but it could not then be said to him, well done, for he had done nothing to form a character either way. But man was made in the image of God. Then, if we understand it of moral image, it could mean nothing more than innocence. The tiger and every four footed beast were equally innocent, were very good, but it is evident they were not created in the image of God. Man's innocence, then, was not what distinguished him as being in the image of God. Admitted, says an objector, but the image of God was found in the natural attributes of the soul. Okay, so remember it was character or attributes or both. So admitted, says an objector, but the image of God was found in the natural attributes of the soul. Thus, man was made in the image of God but God is immortal, so that's an attribute, right? But God is immortal, therefore man was made immortal. Now, R. F. Cottrell says, Now, my friend, if that argument is good and sound, another formed upon the same plan would be equally good. Now, this is really great. This is really important to kind of just take to every aspect of life, right? If you're trying to persuade somebody of something, that's always a form of an argument, whether you're thinking of it in, you know, technical terms of argumentation or not, validity or soundness or any of that. 
um, every time we're trying to persuade someone, we're trying to um, make a point and prove something, we are making an argument, whether we think of it that way or not. And the point is, if our argument is good and sound, another formed on the same plan would be equally good. This is just excellent. But that's a side note. And um, we don't have time to get into that, even though it's a really important topic to just, you know, try to think rightly and to think logically and to be sound. Because if it's not a sound argument, then it doesn't bring you to a true conclusion. Okay. But anyway, back to this. So he's telling them like, okay, if that argument that you're proposing is good and sound, then another formed on the same plan would be equally good. So then he kind of goes about that. He says, but by forming syllogisms after your pattern, we might make it appear that man is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Yes, and further, that man only hath immortality, for this is affirmed of God. This mode of arguing proves too much, therefore it proves nothing. It, that's really an important point too. Look, he, he didn't say it proves my point. He says it proves nothing, right? So if it's a bad argument, it's a bad argument all the way around. It's not going to prove anything. That mode of arguing that he's pointing to here, he says it proves too much. Therefore, it proves nothing. Hence, we must take the most simple and obvious conclusion, namely that man was made in the form of God. Okay, now before we move on and continue reading from R.F. Cottrell in his article here, uh, let's consider that last point that he just made. Okay, now I know we've been talking about the list, this a little bit more, but now I'm going to take it to um, a visual illustration, right? And we're going to see what he means by saying forming syllogisms after your pattern uh, by doing that, we might make it appear that man is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, and even further, that only man has immortality because that's affirmed of God. Okay, so let's just check this out. Let's do some same pattern syllogisms. Now, here's the argument that R. F. Cottrell says is not sound. And that by using this, we can make it appear that man is all these other things, right? So let's plug in some of these other attributes of God and see if what he's saying there is true. So number one, man was made in the image of God. Number two, but God is omniscient, right? So this is there on the lower left. This is the same pattern syllogism as the main one in the center there at the top. Okay. Instead of immortal, God is omniscient. Well, therefore, man was made omniscient. So it's following the same pattern. It's just replacing one attribute with another attribute. And if you follow that same pattern, is this true? Is this a good sound argument? I think it's pretty self-evident that we're not omniscient, right? Okay, here's the other one, omnipotence. Okay, if we use the same pattern, and say man was made in the image of God, but God is omnipotent. That's another attribute of God, but God is omnipotent. Therefore, man was made omnipotent. Okay, probably goes without saying that that's not true, but you know, it's still important to see like, okay, yeah, that's not true. And this is um, panning out what R.F. Cottrell is saying, if your argument was good, then others formed on the same pattern would be equally good, but we're seeing they're not good. And we will see with one more here that if we plug in omnipresent, man was made in the image of God, but God is omnipresent. Therefore, man was made omnipresent. Pretty easy to see that's not true. And again, we could even make it appear that only man has immortality if we were to follow this same pattern, right? But obviously that's not true because no Christian is going to want to say man only has immortality because that excludes God. It doesn't work. Now, after making this point, 
about forming syllogisms. Cottrell says this mode of arguing proves too much, therefore it proves nothing. Hence, we must take the most simple and obvious conclusion, namely that man was made in the form of God. Now, this approach of reading things and taking the simple and most obvious conclusion is an approach that Ellen White not only shared, but also advocated. And of course, she wasn't the only one. We find this a lot in the writings of the pioneers where they stressed that we should take the obvious meaning of the language in the Bible unless a symbol or figure is employed. So here Ellen White says, the truths most plainly revealed in the Bible have been involved in doubt and darkness by learned men who, with a pretense of great wisdom, teach that the scriptures have a mystical, a secret, spiritual meaning, not apparent in the language employed. These men are false teachers. The language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning, unless a symbol or figure is employed. Now, this principle applies beyond just when we're reading the Bible. This is a principle that should be applied to when we're reading anything and when we're reading the writings of the pioneers. We should be just accepting their plain, obvious meaning in the words that they're using and not trying to look for some um, mystical or secret or spiritual meaning that isn't apparent in the language they're using. Okay. So um, when R.F. Cottrell says that we should just be taking the most simple and obvious conclusion, especially after showing already that arguments formed uh, according to that same syllogism aren't good and sound because we can make man appear to be anything. If we're just going by attributes of God, that could just be anything. No, it's simple and obvious conclusion when we're reading these passages about man being made in the image of God. And what is that simple and obvious conclusion? He says, namely that man was made in the form of God, right? Now, this is really what Ellen White said. She said, in the beginning, man was created in the likeness of God, not only in character, but in form and feature. Sin defaced and almost obliterated the divine image, but Christ came to restore that which had been lost. He will change our vile bodies and fashion them like unto his glorious body. Right now, elsewhere, she talks about how man, you know, they were innocent and man was able to um, discern morality. Uh, in the book Education, and maybe even further on in the Spirit of Prophecy. I'm not remembering for sure right now, but I think it was in Education where she says that man had the ability to discern morality. But notice here, she's saying, like, look, man was created in the likeness of God. And it's not just, like, it's not about just character traits, right? It's not about just morality or, and she definitely wasn't uh, um, saying that were made in the attributes of God, like immortality or omniscience or anything like that. Innocence, sure, there's that, but it's not just that, it's also in form and feature. And then she's talking about how sin defaced and obliterated the divine image. Now, what she says will be restored because of that. Notice she says that it's our bodies that are gonna be restored to the glorious condition that we should have had all along. Sin defaced it, but when uh, Jesus comes and restores what has been lost, we will have our vile bodies changed and our bodies, our form, our features will no longer be marred with the effects of sin. And that's part of restoring the uh, likeness that man has to God by being created in the image and likeness of God. That's just the plain, obvious meaning. All right, so we're gonna pick back up now with R.F. Cottrell's article. And after saying that, you know, the simple and obvious conclusion from these passages is that man was made in the form of God, he continues and he says, Christ was in the form of God and is the express image of his father's person. 
Colossians 1, 15, Philippians 2, 6, Hebrews 1, 3. In Genesis 9, verse 6, we read, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. And an apostle says, and this is from James in the New Testament, so he's referring to James. And an apostle says that men are made after the similitude of God. Daniel says of the Father, the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. Chapter 7, verse 9. John describes the Son as follows. And this is John the Revelator. One like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if it burned in a furnace. Revelation 1, verses 13 through 15. Then notice what Cottrell says. He says, a comparison of these scriptures would give us the idea that the Son had the personal appearance of the Father. Okay, now notice the personal appearance of the Father. Okay, there is a variation of the word person. What does he mean by saying the son had the personal appearance of the father, right? Well, he says a comparison of these scriptures would give us the idea that the son had the personal appearance of the father. So let's compare those two scriptures. Let's just see what appearance emerges when we compare these things, okay? So we have Daniel 7, 9 on the left, Revelation 1, 13 to 15 on the right. And we see from Daniel, it's describing the father. And in Revelation, it's describing the son. The father was uh, sitting. He uh, had a garment on. The son of man was clothed with a garment. Um, the father's garment was white as snow. And the hair of his head was pure like wool. Okay, so... It's not describing the father's, you know, feet and chest and that sort of thing, but clearly he had a body. He's wearing a garment. We see here that he has hair. The son has hair. We see that they both have a head. We see that their hair, both, both of them have white hair, looks like pure wool, looks like wool, right? And the rest of the description there, the fiery flame, wheels is burning fires, um, Jesus, uh, the sun's eyes were like flames of fire, his feet like fine brass, as if it had been burned in a furnace. I mean, everything you see here, it's all about something physical. Uh, it's describing their, their body and various body parts and then their their physical surroundings. So everything in the just this description is portraying a bodily existence, right? So when R.F. Cottrell says that they would give us the idea that he had the personal appearance of the father, uh, we're starting to see what he's talking about, right? Everything being compared here, everything being described are, are physical portrayals. Now, it's also noteworthy to say it in the negative. So what's completely lacking in these two descriptions is any mention of their character traits or their attributes like omnipotence, omnipresence, immortality, etc. And remember, Cottrell is countering the notion that God is without body and parts. That's what he's countering. The objection to the idea that man was made in the form of God starts with the premise, well, that can't be because God doesn't have a body. It's, it's just like, not even considering what the evidence shows, it's just starting with the assertion God doesn't have a body and then saying that man being made in God's image then must mean um, character traits or um, attributes. And anyway, so we've covered all that. I, I know it's, I don't want to be too lengthy with this, but okay. So we can see here that um, R.F. Cottrell is really describing the personal appearance as the bodily appearance. Now, this whole thing here, what we're seeing here, this should sound 
really familiar, both from the New Testament and from the writings of Ellen White. And here's a quote from Ellen White. Now, she's actually alluding to Hebrews 1 verse 3 by the, um, the term or the phrase express image. Now, you can compare her statement at the top with Hebrews 1 3. I have it on the bottom half of the slide. But let's read her statement there at the top. The Son of God was next in authority to the great lawgiver. He was in the express image of his Father, not in features alone. Oh, for our purposes here, we'll just stop there. Just think about that. Not in features alone. Well, what is the plain and obvious meaning of that statement? Well, if it's not in features alone, features has to be part of it, right? So she's saying that Jesus had the express image of his father in features. In other words, he shared the personal appearance. He shared those physical features. Okay. Now, she also relates that Jesus told her in vision that he had the same appearance as his father. Um, she says, I have often seen the lovely Jesus that he is a person. I asked him if his father was a person and had a form like himself, said Jesus. I am in the express image of my father's person. So he shared the appearance of his father's person. He had the personal appearance of his father. And that's according to what Jesus told Ellen White in vision. And it parallels what um, we're told in Hebrews 1 verse 3, right? Now, this also tells us what Ellen White meant by saying God is a person or Jesus is a person because um, we can see here that being the express image of his father's person has to do with his outward form and physical features. Okay, that's the same as what R.F. Cottrell said. So we'll return now to this part of his article where we left off, where he said a uh, comparison of these scriptures would give us the idea that the son had the personal appearance of the father. And we can see that this is referring to saying that God has a bodily appearance. He has a body. He has a physical form, a physical shape. Now, again, remember, this is in an attempt to counter the popular view that God is a being without body or parts. And in previous episodes, uh, we've seen evidence from Ellen White where she talks about that being a spiritual view, which she equates with spiritualism. Now, there's so much to this topic that it's hard to say everything, but I just wanted to mention those things so you can have it in mind to look for other content on our channel that gets more specifically into those details and provides more evidence. Okay, now after this, Cottrell concludes his article in a few short sentences. That view is grossly material, says one. And then he responds to that and he says, if it is so, the fault is in the Bible. Why not say finely material? We believe that God is, and he has that in quotes, I'm sure, because um, it's an allusion to uh, Hebrews 11, verse 6, okay? So he says, we believe that God is. Others say they believe he is immaterial. And again, those italics are his. He's stressing these italicized words. So he says, we, you know, we, in meaning the SDAs, we believe that God is Others say they believe he is immaterial. So clearly, SDAs did not believe God is immaterial. Now, that's not the case today, okay, unfortunately. But at the time this was being written, he says, we believe that God is. Others say they believe he is immaterial. We do not say that he is of the earth, earthy. In other words, he's, he's like, we're not trying to say what elements, what type of matter God is made out of. He's not, we're not saying he's made of earth like man is made of earth. 
but man formed of the dust of the earth was made in the image of God. So he's saying both physical, we both have the same type of shape and appearance in general, right? Then he says, this fact has no bearing on the question of the immortality of the soul. Okay. Now, clearly we can see that R.F. Cottrell taught that God is a material being with a body and parts. He's countering the idea that God is immaterial without a body or parts. He says God is material with a body and parts, right? Now, there is something very important to take note of here. And um, it, it's from statements that Ellen White makes in her writings. We see there in education at the top, she says, God is a spirit, yet he is a personal being for man was made in his image. I've talked about that in the last two episodes. Um, George Amidon and D.W. Hull, I believe, are the two pioneers that I was uh, going through when I referred to these statements. So if you want to see more on that, you can go there. But she made that statement in education and in volume three of the spirit of prophecy she says christ taught that god was a rewarder of the righteous and a punisher of the transgressor he god was not an intangible spirit but a living ruler of the universe and at the bottom manuscript 117 1898 she says through jesus christ God, not a perfume, not something intangible, but a personal God created man and endowed him with intelligence and power. Now, again, I've gone through this before, but check out the statements in red. God is not an intangible spirit. God is not something intangible. Now, this might go without saying, but I can relate to having something not appear to me at first to be super obvious until it's pointed out. And then I think, wow, how did I miss that? Right? So I just want to point out that something that is tangible is something that is material. Ellen White's statements here are saying the same thing that R.F. Cottrell was saying. God is not immaterial. Others say God is immaterial, but we say that God is. We say that God has a body and parts and all the rest of it. We're not saying, you know, this, this, I'm speaking as, you know, Arv Cottrell, right? He, he was like, we're not trying to say God's made of earth. He's not earthy, but man formed of the earth or the dust of the ground was made in the image, was made in the form of God. And he makes it very um, pointed to say that the Bible portrays God as a material being. That's really important. Early pioneers pointed out that immateriality is but another name for non-entity. So I hope you can see that for Ellen White to say that God is not something intangible, is saying God is not immaterial, right? Now, at the top, you might be saying, but she said God is a spirit. Doesn't that mean that God is immaterial? Doesn't that mean that a spirit is intangible? And it's an understandable question because today, the common idea about the meaning of the word spirit is that it inherently denotes something non-physical, something intangible. But that's not what the word used to mean. That's not the way uh, the, the pioneers used the word spirit. And when you read through and really examine uh, the Old and New Testament scriptures, you find that the words in Hebrew and Greek that are commonly translated spirit do not indicate anything intangible. And I'm going to put uh, a card at the top for those on YouTube and for those in Facebook. 
I'll have it in the description, both areas, uh, YouTube and in Facebook. I'll have a link to a playlist we have on a different YouTube channel. Um, the playlist is called Before Spirit Was Spiritualistic, and it's all about the meaning of the word spirit and how it did not used to mean anything spiritualistic. And it goes, there's seven uh, videos in the series and it's very informative. It goes through a lot of scripture. So I hope you are able to check out that series. I'm sure you will really enjoy it. And um, I know it, it's like a lot of new information there, but it's very, very important because this really ties directly to the pillar doctrine of the personality of God that R.F. Cottrell was writing about in his article, Man Made in the Image of God, right? So as we see, he sums up by saying, others say that they believe God is immaterial. If you go and look at the modern SDA view of God, the modern SDA view of God is that God is immaterial. That sometimes, yeah, he can manifest with a bodily form, or they might kind of think of him as having a bodily shape here and there. But really, God isn't confined to you know materiality. He's both in time and space and beyond time and space. Or and there's variations within the Seventh Day Adventist movement currently as to um, how they would describe whether God is completely physical or kind of partly physical or has like this second part to him that's non-physical, um, that sort of thing. But these are the aspects that have crept into the Seventh-day Adventist movement that Ellen White fought so hard to prevent from happening. Let's try to help restore the true pillar of our faith regarding the materiality of God and the materiality of all things in general, um, as we discuss in other uh, videos on this channel. So thank you for joining us. Um, again, we just went through RF Cottrell and in our next episode, we're going to be going through a pioneer's writings called, uh, the pioneer's name is AC Bordeaux. So thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time.